big shout out to the understory for the trailer. And like it's seeing that it's like you sort of see something slightly different every time. And this time it was just hearing that little whirring of the projector, which is old. <laughs> that was how it used to be. Um, so welcome to uh, Mill Valley Film Festival, uh, or welcome back if you've been coming over the last couple of days. I'm Zoe Elton, Director of Programming for the festival. And... Um, <laughs> Thank you. And as you may know, we've, since 2015, had an initiative at the festival called Mind the Gap, which is about gender equity. And we've made a huge commitment to women directors, particularly. Um, we are at 53% women directors at the festival this year. We are maintaining that, that you know, that 50% thing. Um, in the hope that other people will catch on as well. Um, so today's film, um, I am thrilled to say, uh, is one of those 53%. Um, it played at Sundance earlier on this year. Uh, the director, Phyllis Nage, you may know from her extraordinary screenplay for Carol. Right, and... Um, I would like to introduce you to Phyllis Naj and Robbie Brenner, her producer. Uh, please come on up. Welcome to Mill Valley Film Festival. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hi, thank you. I feel like we're warming you up. May it be so. We can just stand here and do a routine for two hours. <laughs> I am a woman, I think. I, I, Robbie is. We're part of that 53%. But really, this was Robbie's labor of love. In the beginning, I'll let her say hello and say... Hi, hello. actually, well, it all started with Kevin McEwen, who produced the movie alongside me and David Wolf, who are both yeah. here as well. But they're not women, so they're not going to be up here with us. <laughs> Uh, but it was a long journey to get here, and um, luckily we crossed paths with Phyllis, who came on board and just made a really, really beautiful, incredible film that I'm so, so proud of. So we're so excited to share this with you today. Ditto, Robbie, <laughs> everything you say. And I just want to let you know, it's okay for you to laugh during this film. You know, it's, yes, it has abortion at its center, and there are issues, but it's really about an extraordinary group of women who are part of a collective. I wanted to make a movie about collectivism, which I think we have forgotten about a little these days. So enjoy, and we'll see you afterwards. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Have a great screening. So, to bound back up and thank Robbie and Phyllis for this wonderful experience. Mm. You mentioned uh, before we saw the film that you, Robbie, had been working with this script for a long time. Uh, how long and what were the obstacles to getting it up on screen before this time? Um. So I think Kevin uh, found the script about seven years ago. It was on the blacklist, which is, you yeah, know. Tell people what that is. Yeah. What? Tell yeah, people what that it's is. It's a list uh, in Hollywood of, of sort of, you know, agents, executives vote sort of the best uh, scripts of the year. Unproduced scripts. Yes, unproduced right. scripts. And so Kevin found the script, and we started on this journey, and it had many, many twists and turns, and... It just took a very, very long time to ultimately find Phyllis and get it going and raise the money and COVID and just a lot of, a lot of obstacles. Um, what was the biggest obstacle? Um, I if, think, you, you don't have to answer that, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I just... I, th I think ultimately the subject matter. I think people, you know, pretend that they want to finance movies like 
this and of this subject matter and are passionate about it, but ultimately I think it was really hard to raise the money. Mm. And so David Wolf, who's here as well, right, David. we worked tirelessly to raise the money. It was like crowd raising, paying out of our own pocket to fund payroll while we found the next tranche of money. Uh, COVID, it was just, it was really, really, really challenging to get this movie yeah. made. Yeah, I, I mean, it's fascinating as well, just, you know, when just to sort of hear that kind of trajectory of time and what has happened in our lives since then, you know. Um, Phyllis, when you saw the script, what did you connect with in it the most? What I connected to and still connect to is its interest in, in collective, mm. the mm. notion of how you can get more done with other people. So the notion of the great man, the great woman, all of that, this seeks to set that on its head, that you can do more with others mm -hmm. than on your, on your own. Mm -hmm. Also, I saw the opportunity to speak to an audience that wasn't just the converted, mm -hmm. in a way that, that allowed for a lightness of touch to speak to more people. And, and the ability to be non-judgmental. So pro-choice is one thing. It's absolutely fine to be pro-choice and choose not to support or have a, an abortion oneself, mm. right? This mm -hmm. was very important, that you have to understand that things are not the binary that sometimes politics today makes it, makes it to be. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so you found Phyllis and uh, it became, you got it green, well, it sounds like just actually getting it off the ground was actually quite a journey in general, is that right? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think making independent movies is, it's amazing that any of them get made. Yeah. I mean, making a movie is impossible and making a good movie is completely impossible. So. The fact that we were able to to do this and pull this off is really amazing, and and, and at su such a time in the world where yeah. this all kind of culminated is kind of crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Phyllis, before you've uh, this is your first theatrical feature, right? Or ish? Well, actually, well, they call it that. <laughs> But I think Mrs. Harris was a theatrical Well, that's true. That's right. That yeah, ended yeah. up on HB. That was bought by HBO. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. 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 Um, so at this point in your career, you've, I mean, you've done theater, both as a director and as a writer. Um, what else about Call Jane was, I mean, is, was this this point where you really felt that you wanted to be directing film? as opposed to writing as much or? Yeah, writing is, writing is so hard. You know, yeah. it's much harder than anything else. Don't tell any other director I said that. But <laughs> you, you, you get a lot of help if you are clear and you have a vision. And, you know, it's not me out there doing every job, right? right. But um, you're surrounded by a group of people who hopefully believe in what it is you want to see up on screen. Mm. There's something about the process of making the film um, that is much more satisfying to me in this moment in time than writing. Mm. Although I will continue to write my own spec scripts. I mean, I didn't write this one, but um, actually being able to write um, tells you a lot about structure. It gives you a way to mm. enter a film in post-production and structure it, because mm. really that's what happens. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think that that's an interesting observation about what you do as a writer and, you know, the inevitable, ev you know, editing process that you go through as a writer and how that informs post-production. Well, some guy, one of those men who wrote a book, right, um, said that you make a film three times. Once when you write it, mm -hmm. once when you direct it, and once when you're cutting it. And, and having fulfilled all of those roles on various pieces, once just as a writer, once as a writer-director, and now as a director, um, 
I can say that the place where your film is actually made is in the cutting room, mm -hmm. really. You shape performance, you shape the arc of a film, you can highlight whatever you like, music, which in this film is extremely important. Not so much score, but the entirety of music. Mm -hmm. um, this is a completely different experience than say, putting together a film dry. So you have to see what that all can be from the very first day mm -hmm. you, you become involved. And I think that's what excites people. Also politically, the, the ability to not tell people how things are, because I think that's very arrogant. You know, you ever hear people say, this is the way it is and I'm gonna change the world with my movie. Who the hell changes the world with a movie? <laughs> Nobody. Um, but wait, wait, wait. You don't think this can change the world? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it can have uh, an effect on the way people look at things. It's mm -hmm. about shifting a point of view that you might not have had. You come around to another point of view. Mm -hmm. That's what I think films can do. Mm -hmm. And the less you're trying to preach to someone... Yeah. the better. You have more an effect, don't you think? I think that's what's so great about this movie because it's it doesn't feel like medicine or that you're being hit over the head with, oh, abortion is this way or this way. I think it's a non-judgmental sort of look at it, but it, it's, it's very eye-opening. I mean, showing the whole abortion scene I think was very, very bold and yeah. a choice that Phyllis made. And I think it's important to see these things and, and, and um, so I, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's very easy to watch, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because of that, it's stealthily. You know, I had one person come to a, um, a sort of in editing progress screening and they watched the abortion scene. And about 15 minutes later, he turned around and said, wait a minute, did you just show me an abortion? And I said, yes, I did. Like, is that okay? I mean, it wasn't going to go out because right, someone right. didn't like it. But, but that's the effect. It's this kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to make anybody get up and walk out unless they're bored, right? right. But um, this is the thing that we were going for, really. Well, you were saying on, when you were uh, with, on the director's panel, on director's forum earlier on today, you were also talking about how people feel. Um, and there's something about thinking and feeling. I mean, I think, didn't Maya Angelou said that people, they won't remember, you know, what, what, they won't remember you for what you made them think, but they will remember for how you made them feel. And maybe there's something of that in your approach to this movie um, that actually can shift people's understanding through the way that they feel about the story. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that's true. But I also think that it, you can't separate the thought yeah, from the emotion yeah, yeah. in anything that's complex. Right, yeah. You know, there are so many facets of emotional connection, and I think one of them, unless it's just something that's pablum, right? One of them is intellectual engagement. So mm. if you can ask the question while feeling something, that's even It's better, a double whammy. Probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think also, you know, I mean, for me, I think this is a coming of age story of this woman who is really not alive in so many ways. And through this experience, she finds life in her husband again and in her daughter again and life for herself. Mm -hmm. And so I think that while it deals with abortion, you know, it, it's, it's much bigger than that as well. Yeah, yeah. You were mentioning music and sound. Um, and you had a great composer, but you also have a great soundtrack. Did you have a lot of input on what songs we used, and was that a lot of fun? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm a control freak about music. <laughs> 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 I, um, I had a great, we had a great music super. Got it. And what I said to her was, I want um, period music, not as needle drop, not as, oh, wow, I remember where I was in 1968, which is how so many of, so much right, of that yeah. music is used. But 
I want work by, largely by women of the period who were important, who were sometimes creating activist music, mm -hmm. or women like Janice Ian, where we're going deep cuts on people like her and Nancy Sinatra, even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but also to make room for people like Malvina Reynolds, who we're using right. what's going on down there yeah. during the... Um, and, and so we really, really paid attention to how that works. And then Isabella Summer's score, um, what's great about the way it works is sometimes you can't tell if you're listening to score or if you're listening to an instrumental piece of music mm -hmm. from the period. Um, some of that stuff um, uh, I just wanted to use to shift a tone. So in the scene in the bank, where we're using mm -hmm. um, Let There Be Drums. Mm -hmm. Totally unexpected, right? Um, but to give it that sort of, just let it float. Let's not make, a, make this a, a sort of, oh my God, is she gonna get caught? But it's there. Yeah, yeah, it's the underscore, underscore the underscore. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the choices that you made of, uh, of musicians and noticing also the choices that you guys made in casting. I mean, Elizabeth Banks, Sigourney Weaver, it seems like that these are actors who are actually very aware, very socially aware, very engaged in a lot of things outside of their careers. Uh, you must have had an incredible commitment from them, my assumption is. I mean, can you talk a little bit about the casting process? Yeah, um, so I think that in order to take this movie on, certainly you need to be passionate about the subject matter, and, and certainly Elizabeth and Sigourney both were. Um, Elizabeth, um, actually Elizabeth Moss had been attached to this movie, The Woman from The Handmaid's Tale, yeah. originally. Um, so we started this journey with her, and then we were in the process of raising money, and she called me up one day and said, you know, I just don't think I can play this role. And oh my I God. was like, well, oh, wow, okay, we've been at this for a while, that, you know, what's going on? And she said, you know, I just feel like I've sort of done it before. I feel like it's just, it's just not something that I feel like I can do. As an actor, you have very limited right. opportunities, and this is not something that I feel like I can do. So we moved on, and Elizabeth Banks got a hold of the script, and she called me and said, you know, I love this. I need to do Call Jane. Um, so when Phyllis became attached... Elizabeth was already on board. Oh, interesting. And then I really feel like, you know, <clears throat> Phyllis met with all the actors and sort of really engineered all the rest of the casting and her conversations with them and discussing the script. Yeah, I, Elizabeth was on board, and I happened to have known her for about a decade. Oh, wow. So I was able to um, work, you know, all directors do a pass. Um, right. of a script for production purposes and such. And, and so knowing her and knowing what her strengths were, it was a luxury to be able to work with that, to say, okay, now, you should tweak this a bit because that's her, mm. str that's her strength, right? Sigourney, um, yes, the casting was then um, pretty much fell into place. There were certain people I knew I wanted. Um, beyond the two leads. Um, I always wanted Wumi Masaku to play Gwen. That was, that was my dream list. I mean, I knew all of her work because um, I'm also a, a naturalized Brit, you know. Well, jolly good for you. Yeah. And so <laughs> Wumi, Wumi has been working, I've known of her work for years. Because you worked at the Royal Court, didn't you, at one point? Yeah. That's very amazing. I mean, yeah. that's, I bow to you for that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she, uh, uh, she's who I wanted for that role. I really wanted Grace Edwards to play the daughter. Yeah. The moment I saw her, mm. I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a kid. I believed that kid. Yeah. Chris Messina. Um, Chris Messina in Another Life, I'm sure, would have been a Cassavetes actor. I just love mm. the way he works. Mm. And Kate Mara, of course, I knew yeah. um, through her sister. Um, yeah. who, who played Therese. I'm forgetting the names of the characters <laughs> I wrote. Well, <laughs> Patricia, Patricia Highsmith wrote that. Yes, but, right, right. Um, 
Uh, and so that casting process was very, very harmonious. We had a great casting director, and we'd all watch these, um, these endless tapes, right? Casting the Janes were very important to me because they needed to feel like they were of a piece. Right. That group had to click. Yeah, they had to be. Did you work with them in a particular way to create that solidarity? Yeah, well, like with movies, like I, we, right. I wanted rehearsal, but with movies, you rarely get more than right. like a week, yeah. but you're working three or four hours a day around a table. It's not like rehearsing in the theater. Right. Um, so you have to be very focused about your asks of people. Yeah. So I, would worked, I worked with Elizabeth and Sigourney individually in prep a bit, yeah. and really that's about talking through things and making sure they understand what you want, but equally you, the director, understanding what they probably can give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a two-way street. But once we got the Janes together, it was a matter of letting those women just talk to each other. Right, right, right. And certain ones, I worked with Wumi a little more yeah. because she needed to, I wanted her input on certain things. Mm -hmm. And she had a bigger, obviously, she's more featured than the rest. I was just going to say, um, this is a little off subject, but we shot this movie in, was it 23 days? 23 like days on film, which is... On, wait, on film? On film. All right. We, we shot this movie on film. Uh, Phyllis, you know, came to Kevin, David, and I and said, I'm shooting this movie on film. It's a deal breaker. And I am, I'm not, this is not negotiable. And, you know, obviously it's a lot more expensive to do that. It yeah. doubles your lighting package, your electric. It takes a lot longer. We didn't have the luxury. We didn't have any monitors. You're not seeing everything in real time on digital. You can see everything. So, you know, imagine Phyllis says, not only are we shooting on film, we're only going to use one camera. So I'm like white knuckling at all of us going, we can't even see what's going on. We don't even know if people are saying we're checking the gate to see if there's a hair in there. You don't know right. if the, the actual film is going to be okay until the next day. And we didn't have the luxury of time to go, to go back and to shoot or financially we couldn't do that. And of course, you know, these actors are booked back to back and Elizabeth literally got on a plane like on the last shot and was off to go do her next movie. So right. it was... Um, it was, it so was, you had to be very well organized, and you had to have a very great, you know, your crew had to be really on, on the moment, right, or in the moment. Well, I think Phyllis was really, really so prepared. I mean, obviously, she knew the script backwards and forwards, um, and I think that she had it, you know, shot listed. She worked with the DP yeah. and created a shot list, so coming into it, she knew exactly what she wanted, um, and was very precise about it. Yeah, and, and we shot, don't know if this will register with probably some people in the audience, but this was shot on Super 16, mm -hmm. and we shot a little less than 60,000 feet. So what that means is I wasn't doing a lot of takes, right. three, four. Uh, some of the very difficult um, camera shots, the shots we have, the beginning, the rain, the end, we had maybe nine or 10, you know, those things were complicated. Right. And so we had to get them right. And those were the things we had playback for because you need to see Great. if those shots are technically yeah. working. But we were very, very prepared. That That's not to say that there weren't moments when I would get on the set and I'd see the, just the vibe with people and I'd have to say to the DP, we're not doing that shot. Yeah. We're going to try this. But you have to know the material so well that you yeah. can do that. That's all. Well, I think between your knowing the material so well and your, you know, creating that whole, you know, well-organized uh, ship that you were driving, but also for shooting it on film, that's how you got this gorgeous look. And I thank you both for being here, for bringing this film here today. And all the best as you bring it into the world. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.